Hello, my brothers and sisters. I greet all of you in the name of our Heavenly Father, the one true most high of the heavens and the earth, and that's Abba Yahuwah, the true almighty. I greet you also in the name of his only begotten son, Master Yahushua, the Nazarene, the one who came down and did the work of our Heavenly Father, who gave his life for all of us upon the tree to come to save his people from their sins. And I greet you in their precious set apart spirit, he who is to lead us and guide us into all truth and to remind us of everything that our master has spoken. And my family, I hope all of you are doing well, that you're staying strong in the faith, that you're not giving up, that you are not becoming a Tom, traitor of Messiah. You're not becoming a little Nikki. You see this, my family? A child of the enemy, a child of the devil. And my family, we are to continue to grow in this truth and to grow in this faith. Keep our eyes upon Master Yahushua, the Nazarene, the true Messiah. You see, he's my brothers and sisters. And his heavenly father who sent him through the precious set apart spirit. You see, my brothers and sisters? And so we all have to remember as well that our Heavenly Father, through his precious Son, brought us out of darkness. You see this? So just because we, my family, those of you who are growing in the true anointed faith, we have to remember that there are times when we were enemies of the Messiah. You see this? Traitors of him, Toms, former Toms, former little Nickies. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? Demon children, do you understand? And so it's not to boast and brag, and we are to boast in our creator. But we have to be careful because once we go on this path, as our, because again, a lot of people say, I came into the truth. We, are, we were drawn by his grace and mercy, drawn to his son, drawn to the truth through his precious set of our spirit. And so, my brothers and sisters, we have to remember that once we are proclaiming the Messiah, once you put your hand, once we put our hands towards the plow, we can't look back. You see, my brothers and sisters, if there, if there are errors that we are making, we are to repent. But when you boldly proclaim Master Yahushua, the Nazarene, the true Messiah, and then to turn away, to fall away, and to become a Tom, a traitor of Messiah, you understand, my brothers and sisters, to become a rat, a rebel against the truth, to become a little Nicky, a child of the devil. Do you see, my brothers and sisters? We are not to be like that. But we are to continue to grow as our Father and our King, with the precious set of our spirit, continue to mature us into his children. Do you see this? And to be free from the sinful nature. And so I hope all of you are doing well, my brothers and sisters. Let us give a hand to our Heavenly Father, to his Son. See this, through the precious set of our spirit. And continue to stay bold in this truth, my brothers and sisters. You see, my family, as I find Akeem continues to, uh, as they get permission for me to continue the beautiful teaching called One Flesh, we have to understand, family, that we have to watch out for these false teachers that say that they're coming in Abba Yahuwah's name and saying that they're coming in Master Yahushua's name. Those who are saying that they are for the precious set of heart spirit, but yet they're teaching as far as false doctrine and damnable heresies, we have to beware of these individuals. And hopefully they are recovering, hopefully they repent. And so again, my family, hopefully those of you will, you know, if you have not looked at the previous segments of our Father King's beautiful teaching, you can go back, but you are more than welcome to join us regarding one flesh because we are commanded, you see, it's my family, to love our Heavenly Father, to be obedient, to love his son, to be obedient. You see this? To love our Father King's precious set apart spirit as our Father King's precious spirit continues to guide us. And so we have to be as far as cautious when you have anybody, again, anybody who holds up this book and tells you 
that they are a minister of Elohim. And they're telling you that they can have multiple wives. And you look and you see them with all these women beside them. And they're telling you that they're a minister of the word. You see this? And that if they say that the almighty of Abraham, Yasek and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for your edification, and they say that that almighty one commanded that they can have multiple wives, they are a liar and the truth is not in. You see this? And if any of them are telling you they got the Bible in their hands and they got their hand, I talk about it. You all know this, my family, but as I finally can leave me to say it again, so we can, so this can be in our mind. We can be cautious of these false teachers. If they go to the Bible and they have their hand out <laughs> and they're telling you, give me money, the Almighty say that you would pay me money, you need to get up out of there. Whatever, whatever group you in, wherever you are, and that man holds up his head talking about, give me money. Money coming to me that the Almighty said that He could take your money and charging you to hear the counsel of the Almighty. Get on out of there, my family. You see this? Don't don't believe them. And so, my brothers and sisters, we just got to continue to grow and learn, and to be able to be obedient to the Word. You see this? If anybody holds up this book and they have the counsel of not only the Torah, the Law of the Prophets, which is known as the Tanakh, but even the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. And if they sit here and hold this, this book up, you see this? And they sit here and teach and say that Master Yahushua is a created being. Or they teach that Master Yahushua didn't come of the virgin birth, that Abba didn't sent him. You see this, my family? They are in error. They are false teachers, and they need to repent. You see this? You understand, my brothers and sisters? If they sit there and tell you that Master Yahushua was a racist man and he only came as far as the gospel message is only given for the children of his, Israel only and that Master Yahushua hates other nations and that he was a racist man when he came, they are liars and the truth is not in If any man holds up the counsel, the Brit Hadashah and say that they don't believe in the virgin birth, either that man is mistaken greatly in great error or that man is in error. Point blank period. Do you understand you understand my family? If anybody denies Master Yahushua as the Messiah, as the Mashiach, a person or persons that proclaimed and spoke with their mouth and sang songs and did all type of things saying Master Yahushua was their Savior and he's their salvation, and they denied him. You see this now. Do not bid them the Almighty speak. Do you understand? They are false teachers. Do you understand, my brothers and sisters? Thank you, my father, my king. And so now, my brothers and sisters, as our father king uh, continue to guide us in their beautiful teaching regarding one flesh, that when he created man and he created woman, even going back to our first parents, not a Neanderthal, but our first parents, Adam and, as, his, as we know as Adam and Eve, Adam and Hathua, when he created them, do you see this? He created the man and he created the woman. One and a half, four, five, six women running around, crawling around the garden. You see, my family. One was presented to him. You understand, my brothers and sisters. And so now, let's continue to go on the journey as I find a king lead. And my brothers and sisters, I'm going to be uh, utilizing uh, the Bible software accordance. That way we can walk through the scriptures. You all are more than welcome to have the scriptures with you as far as uh, the book form is concerned. And you can follow along, but I also will have it on the screen, that way uh, you can actually see for your leisure, your leisure and be able to uh, read along and we can grow together. And so my brothers and sisters, let's continue. Thank you so much, Mama King, for what you're doing. And my brothers and sisters, this is something very interesting just to kind of really look at together. That way we can grow and learn. Um, what we have here, is before we go into roof, let's just read this uh, passage of scripture here because a lot of times we can kind of get confused when it comes to the background uh, of, of, of judges and even when we begin to look at the book of Samuel and things of that nature. So one of the things that we need to learn, and let's read this here, Judges the 21st chapter, we're going to read just one verse. And it says here, it says, in those days, 
there was no king in Israel for Yahshua. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's powerful, my brothers and sisters. One of the reasons why, and, and this statement in the book of Judges, those of you who are students of the scriptures, you can actually, uh, if you want, want to take notes, you can. You have, this is mentioned also, you have, um, this phrase is mentioned more than one time in the book of Judges. So you have uh, chapter 17, verse 6, that it's mentioned, chapter 18, verse 1, chapter 19, verse 1, and of course what we're reading here, where that phrase is mentioned regarding that this was a time when Israel was in apostasy, there was so much going on, my brothers and sisters, that Israel was basically, as many of you know, as you read the narrative, you will learn how it was a certain pattern where they would be in sin, doing things that was evil in the sight of our Heavenly Father. And then our Heavenly Father would basically send them into captivity. There would be oppressors that would come. Uh, the children of Yahshua would be in a state of, uh, as far as just, you know, basically a state that's just a chaotic state. And then they would cry out to our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father would hear their cry and he would raise up deliverers, saviors. Do you see it's my family? Judges that will come. He would raise them up for them to deliver his people. And then there'll be a, a point of peace, prosperity, and then that cycle will continue again where we'll, we'll, they will begin to fall again into apostasy. And our father would basically, again, send them into captivity. They would cry out, and our heavenly father would send them, you know, as far as a deliverer to basically deliver the people. And then again, there'll be a point of prosperity. And then again and again, that cycle will, will happen. So what we need to understand is that just like how we have in these times today, people will do things that is right in their own eyes. So we can see that there was, a, there was times in the histories of our ancestors pertaining to the children of, of Israel. And many of them would get to a point where they would do things that was right in their eyes. You see this? And notice how I mentioned how there was not a king. You understand my family? So now we're going to look at something interesting because, again, for people who would try to oppose the beautiful teaching of our final king regarding one flesh, there are those, again, who say, well, hey, you know, I can have multiple wives. Uh, they will negate completely, disregard the intricate details of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see as my family? And they will basically say, well, hey, they had multiple wives and they had concubines, and so I can have it too. This is what many of these so-called men of the most high will say. And many of them, there are some that are well-meaning now. They're just, you know, they've fallen into error, and hopefully they can repent and teach the right doctrine correctly of our father and our king if they choose to. But there are those who are pretty much are in disguise acting cloaking as if they really are messengers of Abba Yahuwah, but yet they divulge and they have this, you know, type of uh, basically foremongers. They enjoy their, as far as their desires with women, and they try to go into the scriptures to usurp it and teach doctrines of devils to make people think that just like how the ancient patriarchs conducted themselves, that they're doing the same exact thing. You see, it's my brothers, when that's not the case. And many of them are getting money from many of them. You see this? They're tickling your ears, getting that bag, getting that money, because that's what really they're about. They're not truly about Abba Yahuwah, as they claim to be. And for those who say that they proclaim Master Yahushua of Nazareth, his son, those who actually uh, subscribe to the New Testament or what is known as the Brit Shah, many of them as well, who say they love and say they're they, they follow the Messiah, Yahushua, of course, many of them will still promote this damnable heresy. And our father king is coming against because you're not going to misrepresent him, nor his son. You see, my brothers and sisters. So now, many of them will say that, well, you know, I can have multiple wives. It's okay. And they got people around them saying the same thing. But one of the things we need to really uh, talk to them about um, as our father king lead family is, and, and hopefully those of you can write this down, write this down. The particular term is called leveret marriage. Write that down. And it's spelled L 
L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E, marriage, leverage marriage. I'm going to read you uh, something very interesting, and we're going to go into the scripture, go back into the scriptures and look at something interesting. And, you know, again, people will say, well, they can, you know, have multiple wives. But one of the things that is very interesting is that you have those out here who may have had siblings as far as brothers who were married. And you have instances where, as far as certain situations happen, where the brother will pass away. And this is respectfully speaking, not to speak to where it is to uh, taunt as far as uh, the, the deceased. But there's uh, instances where you have those who say they're ministers and things of that nature. And you have these men that will come up and many of them, you know, now this doesn't pertain to all of them because some of them may not have had brothers. They might have sisters in that regard. But you have those that have brothers uh, as far as they have passed on that were married. The question is, with many that are having these multiple wives and they have brothers that have passed on and may have had um, a wife and things of that nature and their wives are now widows, are you taking are you taking the responsibility according to the to as far as Israel what is commanded are you taking the responsibility to be a as far as a uh, as far as you know taking the responsibilities of your brother who has passed away are you taking their uh, widow their wife and now marrying them and raising up seed not for your own name but for the name of your brother are you doing that? You see my down. See, this is something to be able to really be able to really zoom in on and key in on. Because there are those out there who basically are living this way. And this is something that as a father king will lead you, you'll be able to guide, to be able to guide you to be able to you to where you're aware of what's going on. So I'm going to read you just something a little bit so we can get an understanding as far as leverage marriage. Because you know, some people may not be familiar with the term. So I'm reading the article. This is a, it's actually a section out of one of my study Bibles that I have. This is the uh, Christian Standard Version study Bible. So I'm reading where uh, an article done by Mr. R. Kelvin Moore. And it, the title is Leverage, uh, excuse me, Leverage, Marriage, and the Book of Ruth. And this is something interesting. And I'm just going to read just something briefly where there's a section called Reasons for Leverage Marriage. You see, it's my family. So it says here, what purpose did leverage marriage serve? Three purpose, purposes are apparent. First, leverage marriage preserved the family estate. Boaz informed the elders and the people of his intentions to marry Ruth in order to perpetuate the deceased, the deceased man's name on his property. So that his name will not disappear among his relatives, or from the gate of his hometown. You see this, my brothers and sisters. Listen. Second, leverage marriage preserved the family name. This was an important consideration in the Old Testament era. Finally, leverage marriage in prohibiting that a widow be married to an outsider provided for the widow. Leverage marriage offered the widow some level of security. The Bible records numerous passages regarding widows, including Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 19, and James 1 to 27. That's very interesting. Because for those who say that they keep the Torah, and many of them brag and boast and says that we are we're keeping the, the, the law of the Almighty and we're keeping it perfectly. This is you have those who make this uh bogus claim. Now you have those that are more smart. And they will say, well, we're keeping the, uh, the you know, certain commandments is what they'll, what they'll say. They're trying to be more, a little bit more sophisticated and trying to be smart to how they perceive it to where they don't mess up. So they'll basically say, well, we're, we're being obedient to the commandments. Uh, and then you have some of them outrageously that will say they're being obedient to the, to the uh, best of their ability. Do you see this? <laughs> but again, in Deuteronomy 14, 20, and 29, it even talks about as far as this particular subject. And even before the law of Moses, you had the instance where uh, Judah Judah had the uh, two sons, Ur and Onan. And so 
the question is, is when people say they want multiple women, multiple, well, you know, some of them more, a little bit more smart, they'll say, well, we don't believe in uh, polygamy. We more so, have, you know, we endorse polygyny. See this, my friend. But the question is, in certain intricate details, where if a brother passes away, and that brother has not had, you know, as far as children, are you marrying, you know, their uh, former wife and raising up as far as children on his behalf to carry on his name? Because there are some that really don't have, you know, some of them can't stand their brothers. Not all, but I'm saying some of them had a bad relationship. And that brother may have passed away and the, the wife is there and they're not taking on those responsibilities. You see, it's my family. So again, when, when it comes to one flesh, there, there's intricate detail, details pertaining to that. And there's certain things that happen. You, you understand my family? Where a man will begin to take on a, a, a wife and, and things of that nature as far as responsibility is concerned. So let's go back into the scriptures to really focus on this to continue to learn as our final king teaches us. Thank you, final king. So now let's go back. For those of you who have your Bibles, let's go to let's go to the book of Ruth. Just want to really look at something carefully here. Thank you, Father Martin. Okay, so let's go to Ruth. Let's go to Ruth chapter one, just to to learn. And it reads, it says, now it happened in the days when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went, or Yehuda, went to sojourn in the fields of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Listen, my family. Verse two. It says, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon, or Mahlon, and Helon, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they came to the fields of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. So we have a situation here, my family, where as far as Elimelech died, so now Naomi is a, she's a widow. She's in a situation now where her husband has died and she's left with her two sons. Now look right here, my family. Verse four. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, or Orpa, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. You see, my brothers and sisters, look at verse 5. It says, Then both Mahlon, or Mahlon and Helion also died, and the woman was left without her two children and her husband. So that was a very, you know, it was a sad situation as far as, you know, Naomi, her husband passed away and then she was left with her two sons. And many of you already know the story as far as the account. And then her sons passed away. And then you had, of course, her, uh, her daughter-in-laws. And, you know, you know the story of uh, many of you. If, if not, you can go back and really look at it. It's a beautiful story where you have the, uh, as far as the two daughters and, of course, Ruth which we know is Ruth today, Ruth, basically uh, is committed to come over into the ways of Israel. You see this? You have some people that will try to say that she was an Israelite woman, but the text is really is basically letting you know when you read it carefully, this woman was from Moab, do you understand? But yet she was willing to take on the ways of Israel, to take on the people as well as the Almighty. And that's why she gave the statement about when she told Naomi, and Naomi said, you can go ahead back to your people the other daughter went to go back, but we know the devotion of Ruth when she was basically saying that your people will be my people, your almighty, my almighty. You see this? So we know how Ruth uh, basically 
was devoted to her mother-in-law, you see, it's my family, and really loved her. So now we're going to go into the section here pertaining to um, Boaz or Boaz. So now let's go to Ruth, the, uh, the fourth chapter, my brothers and sisters, and let's really just learn. And again, for those of you who actually uh, want to, as far as, you know, continue the story or, or your leisure, you can study that. So let's look at verse one. It reads, it says, now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there and behold, the kinsman redeemer of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, my fellow, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Verse two, then he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the fields of Moab, has to sell the portion of the field which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to uncover this matter in your hearing, saying, acquire it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if no one redeems it, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So what's interesting, my brothers and sisters, is that, again, it wasn't just a person who, uh, someone who redeemed. And many of you, when you look at that, um, when you look at the, the Hebrew word goel, as far as kinsmen, or, or also be known as a family redeemer, it wasn't just those who would redeem as far as in the sense of uh, property uh, or, you know, wasn't just property. You can have descendants that could be redeemed, uh, anything pertaining to justice that could be redeemed, but also pertaining to if you had a widow who uh, actually her husband died and to redeem her as far as to carry on the legacy to where the, that man's name, as far as, especially when it came to a, a brother who has passed away, his name would not be forgotten. You see my brothers and sisters? So it was intricate details pertaining to marriage in that regard. There were times where if you had brothers where, again, a brother would pass away, then now that particular situation would come and that, that man could refuse. And when you read the Torah, you will see what happened. You see my family? If somebody was to refuse to handle that obligation, then now there's, there was a certain thing that they would do where they had to, the shoe would be removed. You see this? The woman would spit in the face of that man. That was a humiliating, as far as a thing to be done, because now he is not fulfilling his responsibility pertaining to that. And so for people who are, uh, even today, who are saying, oh, well, they can have multiple women. Well, do any of them have any women? It would be very interesting to see if any of these guys will come up and basically say, well, yeah, this, this particular uh, woman that I have, she actually is the widow of my brother, and I'm taking care of his, you know, as far as the obligation. You see, it's my family. It'll be very interesting. So now let's look at uh, let's look at the next verse here, and we're in verse five here, Ruth chapter four, verse five. It says, "Then Boaz said, On the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the one who had died, in order to raise up the name of the one who had died." on behalf of his inheritance. You see this, my family? Now, this is interesting because, again, we can see here in this particular in intricate detail, again, when it, when it came to marriage, there were certain instances that happened. You understand, my brothers and sisters? And so in this regard, notice as far as what Boaz is saying. Okay, now let's go to, let's look at the next verse here. It says here, so the kinsman redeemer, okay, and that, that's that Hebrew, Hebrew word there as far as uh, 
Gael is concerned. You see this? That as far as that's what's in your strong coordinates, those of you want to look at it is H1350. And you have that, that form, which is a lexicon form, Ga'al. But when you look in the actual Hebrew text, you have, um, as far as Goel, Ha'goel, which is there, it means to redeem. And also it's a meaning to avenge. That's another connotation. So notice what it says. It says, so the kinsman redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So this is something that's that, that that's going on in Israel. This is a sensitive matter. And notice what's the stipulations pertaining to that. Now let's look at verse seven. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the right of redemption and the exchange of land to establish any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? Notice that as far as the custom, these were certain things that was done. You see, my brothers and sisters? This was something that was done when it came to, as far as uh, land, as far as land is concerned, and, and again, intricate details pertaining to, as far as those who have passed on, a brother would have to redeem the name of his, his brother that passed by taking on as far as um, the wife that he had, that particular widow. But also, we have instances where land would have to be redeemed as well. So let's look at verse 8. Thank you, Father King. It says, so the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, acquire this for yourself, and he removed his sandal. Look at verse 9. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have acquired all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Machlon from the hand of Naomi. Do you see that? Notice, see, this is, again, this is very interesting. Notice how the shoe is being removed. See, what's so powerful, thank you so much, Father King. This, let's just really focus on this. This is powerful. People who are saying that they are of Israel, the question is, do you really understand the certain things that represent it, even spiritual? You have the shoe being removed from one to the other. So we see how in certain situations, we see how someone can act as far as the power of attorney is concerned, how when certain things are handed over, how now that person now takes on the authority you understand? Notice how now what belonged formerly to the sons of Naomi now is being given over to Boaz. You see this, my family? This is interesting. And when you and see some people when they when they read the, the book of Ruth or Ruth, many will just read through it and just keep on going. They're not really paying attention to take their time to really read and, you know, to enjoy the story, to enjoy the account, but to also be able to uh, go back and to be able to see as far as the practices and the things that was right to do. When someone actually, uh, whether it was land that needed to be redeemed, whether it was a, a, a person himself could be redeemed, someone who would basically, if they were a poor and needed to go to work, they would actually basically become not, slave as as we would say it today where people have a misunderstanding of, of that word but somebody who was perhaps on financial times they can actually go and work for someone you see this so there was a certain you know as far as stipulation there was certain uh guys they have to follow and they can actually redeem themselves to where they can or someone else can redeem them even when it came to finances to where they are no longer they basically be redeemed out of that situation you understand my family? In this case, we're seeing how land is being involved and we see how Ruth is being involved as well. So let's continue to pay attention and learn. Thank you, Father Marquis. Let's go back. So it says here, look at verse 10, my family. Thank you, Father Marquis. 
It says, and on, now he's, he's still continuing. And also I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Mahlon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the one who had died on behalf of his inheritance so that the name of the one who had died will not be cut off from his brothers or from the gate of his birth place, you are witnesses today. Notice that. Notice my family, the responsibility of, of what Boaz is, is taking. He's willing to actually take her to be his wife. You see this? See, this is an intricate detail. You know what I'm saying? As far as a, a woman being given to him, there's a certain intricate detail why he's doing that. You see this, my brothers? Let's continue. Look at verse 11. And all the people who were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May Yahweh, again, it says Yahweh, we know it's, and I find it can lead, it's Yahuwah. You see this? It says, may Yahuwah grant the woman who is coming into your home to be like uh, Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the houses of Yisrael. And so you shall achieve excellence in Ahrata and shall proclaim your name in Bethlehem. Notice that. Notice what they're saying pertaining to as far as uh, Ruth is concerned. And notice how these men weren't racist men. And it's amazing because you have those today who, uh, even in modern day times, people who claim that they are of Israel, you have those today who, who want to be uh, joined in the faith, but there's certain racial tensions that's going on where people are basically saying, oh no, you can't be one of us because of the color of your skin. See, there's those that still have that wicked racist spirit that's out there in their sectarianism and they need to repent. Thank you, Bob McKee. Look at verse 12. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Yehuda, through the seed which Yahuwah will grant you by this young woman. Look at verse 13. It says, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and Yahuwah granted her conception, and she gave birth to a son. Notice how... We have here, this is interesting. Notice how Ruth, she became his wife. See this? It's, it's, it reads the same in the uh, complete Jewish Bible. That was done by Mr. David uh, Stern. And then we see here in the Hebrew, where it has here, where tehi lu la isha. See that? Notice, and as I found the king corrected, uh, the last teaching, it, the, you have the tape there, which is the prefix. Uh, so notice that prefix there, as far as that tape pertaining to she, notice how it says, tehi lu la isha. Notice how in that particular instance, Ruth became his wife. You see this? See, originally she wasn't because she was married to, as far as the son, uh, one of the sons of Naomi who passed away. But notice how because of that, situation where both her sons died one of the sons was the was the husband of Ruth you see this but now that since he's dead now Boaz notice how now that response he's taking on that responsibility and notice how in that intricate detail Ruth became his wife as it reads in the Hebrew text the Hebrew Mesoretic text. You see, it's my brothers and sisters. So notice how there's intricate details. Why is this important? Because it's showing how in intricate details, how this particular woman in this context is becoming uh, Boaz's wife. You understand? Boaz was not a son of, as far as Naomi's husband. You see, it's my brothers and sisters. See, this is what we got to understand. Notice how Boaz... He's not the son as far as of um, as far as the husband of uh, Naomi, Elimelech. This is not Elimelech's son, but notice how the power of attorney is being transferred over. You see this, my family? With the shoe being removed. Now the inheritance comes to him. He's taking on as far as Ruth to be his wife. Notice that. Thank you, Father Makin. Look at verse 14. It says, Then, the, then the, the women said to Naomi, Blessed is Yahuwah who 
has not left you without a kinsman redeemer today and may his name be proclaimed in Yahshua. That's powerful. Notice the honor of that. You see this? As far as the redeemer is concerned. You see this, my family? It was very interesting. This is interesting too, because you got those out there who say that uh, our heavenly father is the only savior. And again, they miss, again, this is a misapplication because our heavenly father, who is the one true most high savior, he set forth what? Saviors. Do you see this? Well, even in this regard, we see the redeemer here. Do you see this? That we see, please God, master, so that way they can understand and that I can understand as well. Notice how the, that word redeemer, that word goel, you see this? How that can be applied not only to the heavenly father, yes, he is the most high goel, the most high redeemer. But notice how that also is applicable to a man. Do you see this? So notice how as far as Boaz is the redeemer. Does not mean that he's the most high redeemer, but notice how that title is applicable to him. You see this? So for those who are ignorant of the scriptures, will you, will you say, well, okay, and the Tanakh speaks of Heavenly Father only being the redeemer only? He is the most high redeemer, but we see how that particular word, goel, is also applied to a man. Do you understand? Thank you, Father, my king. So notice how in this regard, that now, Boaz now has is basically taking her to be as far as his wife, but also the responsibility. Look at verse 15. Thank you, Father Marquis. It says, it says here, may he also be to you a restorer of your soul and a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. That's powerful. Notice that, my family. Notice that. Notice what is being spoken by the women to Naomi. Let's look at verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and put him in her bosom and became his nurse. See that? That's powerful. Of course, Boaz and Ruth had a child. And notice how Naomi now is taking the child and taking care of the child. Look at verse 17. The neighbor women gave him a name saying a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse or Yashai or Yashai, the father of David or Dawiyah. That's Kyle. Now here's something that's interesting because again, not getting off the subject, but notice how but this union of one flesh, which is a unique union that we see happening here, we see how now that they've had a child, Notice how the saying now, it says here, a son has been born to Naomi. You see this? Notice that. You see this, my brothers and sisters? Notice how it says here, in the Hebrew, it says, it says here, Yulah ben le Naomi. See that? But here's the, here's the revelation. Question is, did Naomi actually bore Obed herself? No, she didn't. Obed or Obed is whose son? Boaz and who? Raul. But notice how now the statement is saying a son has been born to Naomi. You understand? Notice that. So it's interesting where the son is concerned. People have a problem and don't understand as far as the, the beautiful wonderful revelations that was in the land of Israel during that time. These were spiritual people, and they understood that concept of how a son can be born, but also can be adopted or taken over as far as to where someone else can regard them as their son. And we see that here based on what's being specified. That's powerful. Thank you, Father Mikey. Let's continue. Look at verse 18. It says, now these are the generations of Perez. Perez became the father of Hetzron. And Hetron became the father of Ram. And Ram became the father of Aminadab. And Aminadab became the father of Nashon. And Nashon became the father of Salma. And Salma became the father of Boaz. And Boaz became the father of Obed. And Obed became 
the father of Jesse or Yeshai. And Yashai or Yashai became the father of David or Dominic. That's power. So notice that, my brothers and sisters. Notice how David, as far as has that, it had, even though he's a he's an Israelite, his as far as that generation, his father, and as far as root in the line of David, notice how the Moabite was what? He has that history, that background there. Because Ruth, the ancestor of, of David, you see this? Notice how she had that background. You understand? Thank you, Father my King. So now let's go to, let's continue on First Sam. And again, because see, people will go here, and what they'll try to establish is that, you know, having more than one wife, that this was something that was commanded by a Heavenly Father. But again, not really looking at the intricate details as far as, you know, as far as why certain things happen and how men uh, received wives, what things transpired. So let's go to First Samuel, my brothers and sisters. Thank you so much, Baba King. And let's look at uh, verse one and let's just continue to learn. It says here, it says, now there was a certain man from Ramathayim Zophim, from the hill country of Ahriah. And his name was Elkanah, son of Yorham, the son of Eliyahu, or Elihu, the son of Tuhu, the son of Zuth in Ephraim. Okay, so now we're seeing, and again, when a lot of people have to learn, when you go to 1 Samuel, there's a transitioning happening in the land of Israel. Remember, there was no king as of yet. Our heavenly father, the most high king, yes. But as far as a man sitting on the throne, see this. This is at a time before Saul or Shaul, the Benjamite, before he actually sat on the throne. See this, my family? So let's continue to learn. Look at verse 2. Now he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, or Hannah, and the name of the other Peninnah. And Penina had children, but Hana had no children. So this is interesting because we see here something that's happening. Remember now, this is a transition. Remember what we what we read in Judges, how there was a time where there was no king and you had it where men begin to do what was right in their own eyes. You see this? So this is a transition, what, what, what was going on. Do you see this? And Samuel or Shamuel was what? Not only was he a prophet of Israel, he was what? A judge as well. So we have to understand that intricate detail and that transitional period from the judges going into as far as, this, you know, with the seers, the prophets, and, and the kings and things of that nature. So we have an instance here where we have two wives that this gentleman took. You see this? Let's put he had, let's highlight this because see if people will go here to try to establish a certain premise. They'll establish their particular view. And of course, in the Hebrew says, right here, shte, shte nashim. You see my family? Let me highlight that sheen there as well. I don't want to leave that out. Okay, so he had two wives. Now people will, they'll read this verse and they'll stop and say, see, this was this man here. His name was Elkanah, and he was a righteous man, and he had two wives. Okay. Well, again, let's read the intricate details, and let's see what happened. Because what they'll do is people will come here to establish Elkanah. But a lot of them not even living like Elkanah. Do you see this, my family, as far as being a righteous man? Now, but let's see the intricate details pertaining to the two wives that he had. Now, look at verse 3. Because we're going to see, is this something that our Heavenly Father commanded Elkanah to do? Or, or did Elkanah, this was something that he did? You see, it's my family. Now, let's look at verse 3. It says, now that man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to Yahuwah Post in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were priests to Yahuwah there. Okay, so this man, he went to worship 
our Heavenly Father, Yahuwah. There's nothing wrong with that. You see this? So it's not to say that Elkanah was an evil man. This is what people who believe in polygamy and polygyny, they will go here to establish the righteousness of Elkanah, and they'll say, well, hey, he's going up to worship Yahuwah. He had two wives. But let's look at something interesting. Now look at verse 4. It says, and the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, and he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her, and her daughters. It says, but to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but Yahuwah had closed her womb. So this is interesting. So notice, my family, how we see what? Relations pertaining to how he conducted himself with his two wives. And notice how he gave Hannah double portion. Do you see this? So for him to give a double portion shows what? Shows that not that he was a wicked man, but it shows that obviously there's a reason why he gave a double portion of Hana. You see this? Notice how the other wife, let's go back up. Penina, she, he, it says he gave, he gave portions. So that was something that he did. So she didn't have to go without. See this? So let's look at this. So he would give portions. See that? Let's look at it. Okay, so that's something that he did. You understand, my family? But I want you to look here. Notice how with Hannah, she got what? She got a double portion. So obviously we see something that what? We see something that is not balanced to where both of them are getting a double portion. So we can see his love for her. Correct. But we also see that the Master Yahweh had, at this particular, at this time here pertaining to the contest, closed her womb. Pen, the other woman, Panina, had children. Now, let's look here. Look at verse 6. Let's look, look at verse 6 very carefully. It says, her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because Yahweh had closed her womb. Did you all see that? In the CJB, it says her rival taunted her and made her feel bad because Adonai had kept her from having children. And of course, in the Hebrew, it says, where ki, look what's in the Hebrew, it says, where, where ki asata, zar, it says, uh, zarata, gam ke as, be avur, kir imia, ki sagar, yahua ba'ad, rachmah. You see that? So, but what I want you to focus on is this as far as her rival is concerned. You see this? See, this is what a lot of people not focus on. See, they'll go here to establish Elkanah. But what a lot of them will do is they will gloss upon him being a good man, him being a worshiper of, of Yahuwah, and they will go here, but they won't deal with the fact that there was what? There was a rival between the wives. So the question is, is this, is this, now this is something, let's focus, thank you, Father my kid. Let's look at something. So the question is this, it, do you all think that it is the will of our creator for a man to have more than one wife and for there to be rival there, to be as far as a contention or some type, to where a woman who may not be having children is taunted because the other one is having children? Is that the will of our? No, it's not. And if anybody pulls up the scriptures and says that that uh you know that is part of the will of the Almighty, they are a liar and the truth is not in them. So yes, Alkana, who was a, a man who worshiped the creator, he went to, to worship, to do sacrifice. He had two wives, but again, the intricate detail is, is that there was a certain issue between them. One wife received portions, her and her children, but we see the other one who did not have, she was not able to have children at that time, Master Yahweh would close her womb, she received a double portion. And it specified that Elkanah loved her, and that's why he gave her a double portion. And understand that there was a rival between the two. You understand? How is that significant? Because now we're able to see the intricate de detail pertaining to that. But for some of these men, 
who have multiple wives, are you giving your wife, <laughs> thank you, Father, are you giving one wife some portions, her and her children? Are you giving the other wife a double portion? You see this? See, a lot of these hypocrites out here, they have their multiple wives, but a lot of them, they're giving their wife what? Equal share of everything. You know why? Because they don't want no problems. You see this? You understand? And, and see, you women, daughters of Shirah, the real ones now, I'm not talking about the ones who are playing like they're daughters of Shirah, but this is something that you can really look at. You understand? Heavenly Father is almighty one of fairness and equity. But we see here, this is how Elkanah, this, this does not make him an, an unholy man, but this is based on the intricate details. He gave one wife double portion. He gave the other wife portion, Penina, but Hannah, he loved and gave him another portion. But notice how there was a certain what? It was a right. It wasn't that, now the scriptures are not saying that Hannah was actually a taunting Penina. But we see here, it's the other way around, isn't it? Thank you, Father King. Let's continue to learn. So verse six again. It says, her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly, bitterly to irritate her because Yahuwah had closed her womb. You see that? Look at verse 7, my family. And so it would happen year after year. As often as she went up to the house of Yahuwah, she would provoke her so she wept and would so she wept and would not eat. That's powerful. So this was something that was what? This was not just one rival issue. Notice what it says. It says, so it would happen year after year, as often. You see this? Notice that. Verse seven, it says, now this is how David Stern, Mr. Stern translated it. He did the same every year, and each time she went up to the house of Adonai, she taunted her so much that she would cry and not eat. Do you see that? So notice the issue, notice the intricate detail here, what was going on between the two wives that Elkanah had. Do you see this? This was something that was repeated. You understand? Thank you so much, Mama Key. Look at this. Year from year that this happened. Shana by Shana. Do you understand? Shana as far as year is concerned. Shana by Shana. This was something that was happening often, my brothers and sisters. To where she was crying. You understand? She was provoked to where she won't, she wouldn't even eat. You understand, my brother sister? It says, Tak Isana, where Tifka, where Lo, to, to a call. So this woman was not, as far as Hana, she was not even eating. As far as, you know, just being taunted, she felt bad. You understand, my family? Look at verse 8. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hana, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than 10 sons? So notice how Elkanah, he was concerned about his other wife in this regard. He's questioning as far as why she's sad, why she's crying, why she's not eating. You see this? And notice what he said, am I not better to, to you than, sen, than 10 sons? So he wants to know what's going on. So it shows that Elkanah was concerned. He wasn't a man that was like, you know, well, forget, you know, you crying, you know, shut up woman and this, that. Like some of these people out here who, who claim they got uh, multiple wives, a lot of them talk, they women, they, well, excuse me, thank you, Father, keep the correction. A lot of these men talk to their so-called wives in a disrespectful manner. A lot of you cuss at your women. A lot of you hitting your women in secret places. But you're trying to keep that reputation. But I'm going to strip that reputation and break you down because you're not going to come against his word his holy prophets, his holy word, and, and basically misapply it. You understand? Thank you, Father, my king. Look at verse 9. 
Then Hana rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of Yah Yahweh. And look what it says. It says, and she, bitter of soul, prayed to Yahweh and wept despondently. You see this? That's powerful, isn't it? Another, another way of saying that is how Mr. Stern uh, translated that. He said, it, it says, in deep depression, she prayed to Adonai and cried. So she, this woman was going through it. Now watch what she says. That's very interesting. And she made a vow and said, oh, Yahuwah hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and, re and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a seed amongst men, then I will give him to Yahuwah. Yahuwah. It says Yahweh. We know it's, it's Yahuwah. I will give him to Yahuwah all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. That's powerful. You know, what's interesting is that she really wanted to have a son. And what's so powerful about that is notice how she made a vow. She made a promise to our creator. She, she didn't just want to have a son so she could compete with her, her uh, as far as the other woman, the other wife of her husband. Notice what she's saying. And you know what's powerful is that many people today who really want to have children, the question is, do you really want to have a child for your reputation? Or do you really want to have a child to give that child back to Master Yahweh? Because Master Yahweh is the one who, who really owns all of our children that we have. Yes, it's your child, but you, you're responsible for that child. You're the caretaker. And we live in a time where so many people, they can't wait to be like, oh man, I, I want to get rid of my kids. But wait a minute. I have a father, children, the scripture says children are a gift from the, from the creator. So the rhetorical question many people need to ask themselves is when you have children, what are you going to do for the creator? Are you going to give, are you going to dedicate your child back to him? We're not talking about just no, just some christening like people want to go with the motions of things. When they go through this ceremony and invite all these people, I'm just saying. What I'm saying is if you're going to really give your child, are you really going to dedicate your child Teach your child about the creator. Your child should not know about all these other cartoons better than the scriptures. It's amazing. Thank you, Father King. It's amazing how a lot of people who have children today, the child can recite songs and lyrics and cartoon characters, and they know the whole history of all these things. But when you ask them about the creator, they don't, they're like, who? So the question is, can you be like Hannah in this regard? He promised that she would do what? Let's look what she said again. Thank you, Father, my king. See, he's the creator. Every soul belongs to him, not you, not us. As a parent, you want to do what? Teach your child about Abba Yahoo. Teach them about Master Yahushua. Teach them about the world. You prepare them for what they got to face as they grow older. Not for you to sit here and benefit off your child. Look what Hannah said, the great woman of Master Yahuwah. She says here, and she made a vow and said, Oh, Yahuwah of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a seed amongst men, then I, let's highlight it, then I will give him to Yahuwah all the days of his life. You see this? That's powerful, isn't it? Notice that. Notice the vow what she made, what Hannah made. You understand? To the creator. She didn't just want to have her son who became the great prophet, Shamuel. She didn't just want him so she, so she can compete and have a reputation with the woman that was taunting her, Elkanah's other wife, our ancestor Penina. Uh, Do you see this? She wasn't just trying to compete with her. A lot of you want kids just for the sake of competing with somebody else. Everything is competition to you. But notice what the woman, the great woman of Abba Yahoo, notice why she wanted her son. And her son became what? One of the great prophets of Israel. Notice her heart and why she wanted to have a child. Thank you, my father, my king, for who you are. 
Now that's powerful. Now let's stop for a moment. So notice how, again, my family, we're looking as our father, our king, all power to him, his precious son and precious Holy spirit. Notice how, notice the intricate detail as far as even though Elkanah, a man of Israel, this man who knew Master Yahweh, he went to worship him, the scriptures are not saying that he was an evil man. This was a man who had two wives. But people will go here and they'll read the part where it says two wives, but they don't go and deal with how there was a certain what? There was a, there was a rival. One wife taunted the other wife. You see this? They also didn't talk about the double portion. One wife got a portion, but the other wife had a double portion. You understand? So again, they will go, those teachers will go here to my ancestor, our ancestor Elkanah, and misrepresent him. We'll misrepresent our ancestor, Hanak, and what she had to deal with. And they'll read the passage where it talks about he had two wives, but they're not dealing with the intricate details pertaining to that. Thank you, my father, my king. So now, my family, let's continue to learn and go into the scriptures. Let's go back to the beautiful scriptures and learn. So now, we're going to go to, we're getting closer to the King lead. We're going to get to, to King David now. Because see, a lot of people, they want to go to our ancestor, Dawiyad now, and they want to play it around. But see, Abba got something specially, a special, wonderful surprise for you, you false teachers out there. Because you're not going to misrepresent re represent his word. You're not going to represent, misrepresent David, the king of Israel, Dawiyad, my ancestor. You understand? See, people want to go and run and talk about, oh, David had multiple wives, so I can have multiple wives too. Well, let, let's look as our Father King guide us through the, this precious spirit, as our Father King guide us with a precious set of our spirit on the intricate detail pertaining to David. Now, let's look at this, this here. Let's turn your books or you can read along with me. First Samuel chapter 18, let's commence at verse 20. And it reads, it says, and Mikah, Shaul's daughter, Love David, but not well. Of course, in the Mesoret text, it has Dawid here. So they told Saul or Shaul, and the thing was right in his eyes. So notice that. So we have a particular woman here, Mika, our ancestor. She was the daughter of Shaul. And notice how she loved David. See this? Notice that. You understand? Now let's continue. Let's look at verse 21 and let's learn as our father King teaches us. And Saul or Shaul said, I, now, now listen, my family. See, now we're going to look at the intricate details. Thank you, Master. Let's, let, me, let me stop for a moment so we can really focus on something. Now, mind you, in, our, in the teaching about our, our king, his last teaching, our father king's last beautiful teaching, notice how when you wanted to marry a, a, a woman as an Israelite, you couldn't just go up and just marry a woman. You had to consult the father a dowry, a bride price had to be paid. And again, a lot of these hypocrites out here, some of them got beef and issues with their wife, father. Some of them, they're not even talking to, to them. They have no relationship. You understand, my family? So now we're going to look, and we're going to look at this intent here of Shaul, as our father King reveals the heart of Shaul. We're going to see if Shaul Saul, King Saul, if Shaul, if he really wanted to give his daughter to David because he was really happy for David, that we are? Or was there a hidden agenda behind why he wanted to give his daughter to King David? See, this is a time where Shaul began to have that envy and that jealousy of King of, of David. Now he's the king already. Dawiyah is not the king as of yet, as far as sitting on the throne. Right now, Shaul is sitting on the throne. So now with that in mind, now let's go back into the scriptures and, and really look as a father king guide us. Thank you, Master. So now let's go back. So it says here, look at what it says in verse 21. First Samuel chapter 18, verse 21. It says, and Saul, or Shaul said, I will give her to him that she may become a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Shaul said to David, or Dawiyah, for a second time, you may be my son-in-law today. Notice the craftiness of our ancestor, Shaul, King Saul. You understand my family? Notice that. Look what it says in the, in the complete Jewish Bible. It says, Shaul said, I'll give her to him 
so that she can entrap him and the Philistine can do away with him. So Shaul said to David, today you will become my son-in-law through the second and has daughter in the towers. That's interesting. Notice that, my brothers and sisters. So we see what? We see the intention here. See? You see this, my family? Now, of course, we know that Abba is not going to let this happen. He, he, see, our father has rejected Saul. David is the one that's going to is the one that's going to become king. But notice how. Notice what. As far as what um. What the king wants to do. You see this. I want you to see this. Notice that. It's to ensnare him. It's not to really give his daughter because he loves David. You see this? Let's continue to learn. So I want you to see the intentions. Now watch what happens. Verse 22. Then Saul commanded his servants, speak to David secretly, or doubt y'all secretly, saying, behold, the king delights in you, and all his servants love you. So now become the king's son-in-law. Notice the craftiness of what he, he's commanding his servants to do and how to speak to David. You see this? Watch my brothers and sisters. Look at verse 23. So Saul's servants spoke these words in David's hearing, or Dawiyah's hearing. But David, or Dawiyah said, is it trivial in your eyes to become the king's son-in-law since I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? Notice that, my brothers and sisters. What a powerful question. See, I want you to see the humble state of David. You see this? Notice this. Notice what he says. And even in Hebrew, it says, Where Anaki Ish Arash, where Nikla or Nikla. Notice that. Notice his humility. So, what does this show? Remember in the Afana King's last teaching, beautiful teaching, how you had to pay a you had to pay a fee for a woman. You can't just go, you know, just have relations with a woman and, and just skip her dad and bypass her father. Notice how he's, he's, notice David. Now, this is the king of Israel now. David is being humble. He, he's saying, I'm a poor man and I'm lightly esteemed. Now, watch, watch what happens in verse 24. As we continue to read, it says, and the servants of Shaul told to him, according to these words which David spoke, about Yahweh spoke. And Shaul then said, this you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry except 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Notice this here. Notice that. You see this? See again. See, I found the king going to stop all of you in your tracks for those who it pertains to. Notice how Shaul is letting them know what the payment is. And what is that payment as far as the enemies, the Philistines is concerned? See, Shaul is trying to set David up. So David, he's trying to put him in an impossible situation so that way David can be killed. This is what he's trying to do. He's Now, this is a king. He's being crafty now, using his daughter as a means to kill David. You understand? So notice the payment here. And notice what the payment that he wants. 104 skins of the Philistines. Do you see this? Notice that. This is what he got to pay. Now, now this is so powerful because, see, David's a warrior. He, you know, he's cool with that. You see this? David know he can do this with the help of the Almighty. Now, watch. Now, look at, look at as we continue to... Uh, to the verse. Let's go back and read it again. It says, so Saul then said, or Shaul said, this you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry except 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Now Shaul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Do you see this? See, this is something that he was planning. And, and notice in the CJB it says, for Shaul was hoping to have David killed. By the Philistines. Do you see that? That's powerful, isn't it? 
Notice how he was planning. See, this is something that was concocted. He was trying to be sneaky. And the Hebrew says, when Shaul hashav lehatil et David beyad pilistim. So he was trying to have this man killed. He wasn't playing around. Notice that. But my family, the rhetorical question is this. You think our Heavenly Father is going to let the man after his own heart die based on the, the planning of, of right now, the enemy of the anointing of Abba Yahweh? No, he's not. And Abba knows exactly what he's doing. Do you understand? We're, see, we're, as our Father King lead, we're looking at the intricate detail of how this woman became David's wife. This is one of the women that we're looking at here. You understand my family? Now, did any of you all out there who got one, uh, all these uh, multiple wives, did any of your wife look look to your right or look to your left? Thank you, Father Baki. My family, this is interesting. Tell these, these, these hypocrites out here, those of you who are Congress, and not be disrespectful, but look to your left and your right with all these women that you got and, and see if any one of them did you have this experience with any one of them? Did their father try to kill you and use one of these daughters to try to try to kill you? And I have a father delivered you out of their hand to where that woman became your wife? Or did you just say, you know what? Shalom. How you doing, Akuti? I like you. Become my wife. But they say it's okay. Did, did you trick some of the women like that? Did you experience something like David did since you want to say David had all these wives and concubines, I can have one too, or I can have some too, right? Are you having the same experience that our ancestor Dalton Yard had? Or are you playing around? Because see, a lot, that's a lot, that's exactly what a lot of these hypocrites are doing. Thank you, Father King. Let's go back. That's a Father King lead. So notice here. How he's trying, King Saul is trying to plan to kill David by using his daughter as a means, as a vehicle to get the job done. You see this? Look at verse 26. Then his servants told David these words, and it was right in the eyes of David to become the king's son-in-law. So before the days had expired, see, David was cool with that. You know why? Because David was a warrior. He knew, see, David didn't have, as far as the financial means of to, uh, taking uh, the daughter of Saul to be his wife. But when Saul gave the, you know, as far as the dowry, David was like, I can do this. With the help, with the help of the Almighty, David knew he done killed the lion. So with the power of our Heavenly Father, what makes you think he wasn't confident that our Heavenly Father would, would have him uh, to go and to kill the Philistines and to reclaim the daughter of, uh, as far as of uh, Shaul. But see, the difference is, my family, the intricate detail is that David loved Shaul. But at this point, Shaul didn't love David. He was trying to kill him. You see this, my family? Look at verse 27. David and Dalyad rose up and went, he and his men, and struck down 200 among the Philistines. Then David and Dalyad brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. So Shaul gave him Milcah, his daughter, as wife, as a wife. You see that? Notice how, now let's let's go back up and look at something interesting. Notice how when you go back to verse 25, King Saul is going to give David the actual dowry price. See, this is something in his mind that he that he thinks David is not going to be able to accomplish. But little, but see, he has to realize that Abba Yahu. Is with David. Notice how he said 100 foreskins. How many foreskins did David and his men brought back? Go back down. Look at verse 27 again. David rose up and went, he and his men, and struck down 200 men among the Philistines. Did you see that? So basically, David and his men went and, and paid double. And what they saw had to do. See, again, in ancient times, the word was bond. When you spoke something, you were bound by that. As the king, Shaul knew that if he would have reneged on that, they would have been looking at him like, okay, you're supposed to be the king. You're supposed to have integrity. So notice how when David did that, Shaul had to give his daughter up. And see, this is how 
this particular daughter, this particular daughter of Shaul, King Saul, became David's wife. You understand? This is why. Notice how it says here at the latter part of the verse, it says, so Saul gave him. You see that? See, he had to do it based on the conditions that he, out of his own mouth, put out. See how Abba did? Abba Yahweh would cause him to do what? Basically, he had to he had to go back and deal with the words that he spoke out of his mouth. You understand, my family? That's powerful. Thank you so much, Father King. Thank you so much. All right, now let's look at, let's continue at verse 28. It says here, we are, okay, we read this. Let's go to verse 28, chapter 18, verse 28. It says, then Saul or Shaul saw and knew that Yahweh was with David about Yah and that Michal, Shaul's daughter, loved him. See, this was something that, that Saul had saw. See, this was a revelation. See, even though he meant um, as far as evil for David, he, he actually came to the realization and understood that what? Number one, Yahuwah was with him, Master Yahuwah was with him, and also that his daughter loved him, loved David. See, he had an issue with that. And how do we know he had an issue with that? Look at the next verse. Look at verse 29. So Saul or Shaul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. You see that? So he, he was afraid now because he knew his time was up. But notice how he was an enemy. Notice that. Look at verse 30. Then the commanders of the Philistines went out to battle. And it happened as often as they went out that David or Dalyah behaved himself more insightfully than all the servants of Saul or Shaul. So his name was highly esteemed. Notice that. Notice how now his reputation is beginning to grow. This was a man who just we just read earlier where when, uh, as far as Shaul offered his daughter, notice how David was at a point where he, he didn't have, he, he was poor and he was, you know, lightly esteemed. But notice how I have the father even though King Saul, who was jealous, tried to kill David, I have the father worked out in his favor to where David was able to not only receive as far as the uh, the daughter of the king, but also his name was, was actually exalted. Notice that. See, there's nothing wrong with exaltation. It's when I have the father's one that's doing the exalting and not yourself. So notice the intricate details, my brothers and sisters, when it came to one of the one of the women who became David's wife. You see this, my brothers and sisters? Now, let's go to 2 Samuel. Let's look at the 16th verse, because now we're going now into a time where, of course, David had made that error with Bathsheba. Many of you know that. And our father king had to deal with him. Of course, the child had died. Remember now, our father promised that the Mashiach was going to come through his loins. And even though Bathsheba and Da'uyar at that specific time were deserved, they, they deserved death. Notice how Abba took his sins away through the prophet Nathan. He took his sins away and he did not die. But yet the child who did nothing wrong died. Understand? See this? And you got people out here today saying that nobody can, uh, uh, nobody can die for the sins of their father. You see this? But we see what happened when that innocent child who didn't commit adultery we see what happened to that child. Remember, the promised seed of the Mashiach was promised to come through the loins of David. You see this? The rhetorical question is, do you think the Messiah was going to come through that particular union pertaining to the Uriah and that situation that happened? And for those of you as you're led, go back and look at the beautiful teaching of our final king, the salvation of the father through the son of David, and you will be greatly enlightened. You see, it's my family. But notice how this is the time as far as when now Abba said that he would, that the sword would never depart from the house of Dalia. And even though David at that time, when he did things secretly, as far as that adultery is concerned, 
he talked about how a certain one will lay with all of his wives. So now what we're going to look at now is the spirit now of the, the spirit of usurping, that usurping spirit. And many of these so-called men who, who, who say they want multiple wives, many of them, what our final king is going to reveal is many of them have that same spirit. And this is very interesting. So now let's look at this. We're going to go as a final king lead. See, this is that rebellious spirit that wants to rule. Now, let's go to the situation with Absalom, which is a son of David. And mind you now, this is punishment for what David Dawiyad has done during that time. Now, let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 16. And let's look at verse 15. It says, now Absalom, or Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, or Yahshua, had entered Yerushalayim, or Yerushalayim and Ahithophel with him. Now, we got to watch this individual here, Ahithophel. This is something that really... He on this individual here, one of our ancestors. I look at verse 16. And it happened that when Hushai, the archite, David Adalyat's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king, long live the king, or Yehi Hamalet. This was something that they said in ancient times, as far as the life of the king. See this, my family? Of course, we have those people out there who are going to try to mock the things of Israel, and now they have established these things to raise up rulers for themselves. You understand? But notice how the king of Israel, how he was held in that regard. Now, this, again, this is someone now who has become king. David is still the king, but now this person here is being recognized as the king now, Absalom. Now, look at verse 17, my family. And Absalom said to Hushai, is this your loving kindness to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? See, now he's questioning the integrity of Hushai because Hushai is not David or not Uyah's friend. He sees my family. Hushai has to be very careful here because if he's not, as far as speaking the right way, Absalom could kill him. He sees my family. So notice how Absalom is questioning the loyalty of Hushai. He knows that Hushai is his father's friend. And this is why he's questioning him. I look at verse 18. Thank you, Father, my king. Then Hushai said to Absalom, No, for whom Yahuwah, this people, and all the men of Yahshua have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. You understand that? This is a wise saying of what Hushai said. And Hushai is not trying to be deceptive at all because we know who, who Yahuwah is with. Yahuwah is still with who? David. He still chose it to be the chosen king, but Hushai is speaking very carefully because he recognizes that his life is in danger. If Hushai for one minute would have, would have specified and said that I don't recognize you, I recognize your father, if he would have spoken in that way, he would have lost his life. But notice the wise saying of what he's saying here. Look at verse 19. As he continues, besides, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son as I have served in your father's presence? So I will be in your presence. Notice that. You see this? Notice how he's being very wise. He's showing humility here. You see this, my brothers and sisters? Now let's continue. Let's watch what Absalom does here. Verse 20. Then Absalom said to Aphitophel, Give your advice. What shall we do? And Afitafel, now let's watch what he says, this individual says here. And Afitafel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself odious to your father. The hands of all who are with you will also be strengthened. Notice that. Notice what Afitafel is telling him to do. Basically, he's telling him, sleep with your father's concubines. See this? More than one woman here. Now, look at verse 22. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Yahshua. You see that? That's powerful there. And this again, this was a fulfillment and a punishment of what Abba said that would happen to Dawiyah for him as far as him being disobedient and doing the atrocities in ancient times, you know, as far as with uh, 
Bathsheba and how Uriah, our ancestor, was killed. But notice Absalom and what he did as far as the tent and how he's basically sleeping with, with uh, his father's women here as far as the concubines is concerned. Look at verse 23. Now the counsel of Ephetophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if one asked of the word of the Almighty. So was all the counsel of Ephetophel regarded by both David and Absalom. So that shows there that there was a time when Ephetophel, as far as his, his uh, renown is concerned. You see this? This was a man that had, as far as a reputation, someone who was known as a counselor. But we see what's going on here now pertaining now what Ahithophel is trying to do. You understand, my brothers and sisters? Now, let's go to 1 Kings. So again, I want you to see the intricate detail and what happened. This is a time now where Absalom and Daliyad are having issues. This is the son of David who's challenging his father and challenging for the throne. This is a very tragic time in Israel. First Kings chapter two, and let's start at, at verse one. Now, this is powerful. Now, let, before we read this here, let's think about this. Now, King David, our ancestor, King Baliyah, the man after the Almighty's own heart. Now, we're going to read at a point where he is, he's become old. He's getting ready to leave this world. Now, a lot of people out here, many of you, a saying that you can have multiple wives like King David, like my ancestor, the great King Da'uyah, the warrior of Master Yahweh. And many of you are saying, well, David had uh, wives and concubines, so I can have one too. I can have, I can have some too. Not one, some. Thank you, Bob my King. Some of you, you say, I can have multiple, we can have multiple wives. Many of you, you get in the Bible and your teacher saying, we can have multiple wives. This is what you're doing with the Holy Book. Lying. Saying you can have multiple wives. So now what we're going to do, as our Father King helps us to read, as our Father King, through the precious spirit, teaches us, we're going to see that even though David, King David went through all that situation, those situations that he went through, and notice how his wives and how it's even the, the daughter of King Saul, his enemy, how she became his wife. Now we're going to see, for those of you out there who are misrepresenting my, my ancestor, King David, we're going to see if David was like you and if David taught his son Shalomah, Solomon, King Solomon, we're going to see if David taught his son and said, my son, you can have multiple wives. This is what, <laughs> this is what we're going to see. We're going to see if David was like many of you all out there. Who, now, remember now, David knew the Torah. David knew the law better than many of you out there. King David knew about the law. So we're going to see if while, he, while he's talking to his son before he getting ready to leave his earth, we're going to see if he said, my son, King Solomon, you, you, know, you keep all the commandments, and by the way, you can have multiple wives. And we're going to find out and see if Abba commanded that. If he taught his son that. Let's go into the scriptures. Thank you, Father, my king. Because here's the thing. If the thing is, if King David didn't teach that, then now we got to question your teachings. See this. Now, thank you, Father, my king. So let's go and look at what our king, king David said. See this during that time. Let's see what King David said, our ancestor. We're going to see if he taught what you all out there teaching. First Kings, the second chapter, start at verse one. It says, then David, or Dalyat's time to die, drew near. So he commanded Solomon, or Shalomah, his son, saying, and let's listen to what our ancestor said now. Let's find out. He says, I am going the way of all the earth. So you shall be strong and be a man. And you shall keep the responsibility given by Yahweh, your almighty, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, or Moshe, Masha. He says that you may be prosperous in all that you do 
and wherever you turn. You hear that? This is what King David is telling his son to do, my brothers and sisters. He's telling his son to be obedient to the law of the Almighty. So the question is, my brothers and sisters, did Mo see these people out here playing around. They're talking about Moses is their teacher. Moses is Moshe or Mo Masha is their rebellion, their teacher. Then Moses, when he came down from Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, as we know, when he was holding the beautiful tables of stone, did Masha tell the people when he looked, up, looked upon the people, our ancestors, and he was looking up at them, did he tell them and said, you can have the, oh, thank you, Father Makia. Did the great prophet say, you can have multiple wives but said you can have multiple wives. Did he say that? And not one of you hypocrites better open your mouth and dare say that Masha of blessed memory commanded and said that Abba said it was okay for the men of Israel to have multiple women. Not one of you better lie and say that. So if Masha himself of blessed memory did not teach that and Abba did not teach that through his mouth to tell the people you see this? If Masha didn't teach that, then why would David teach that to his son? You see this? So we have to be careful and be able to differentiate between the commandments and statutes and judgments, the beautiful ordinances of Abba Yahuwah, and certain things as far as customs that happen. Practices of the ancient Levant, of the ancient Near East, of our ancestors. And how a second wife and how wives was given during that time based upon stipulations pertaining to if a woman was barren or not. Those intricate details. You understand, my family? So let's continue to learn. Thank you, Master. So what did David say? Let's go back and look at it again. Thank you, Master. Go back. Verse 3 again. Let's read it. He says, And you shall keep the responsibility Observe the charge. See this, my family? And you shall keep the responsibility given by Yahweh your Almighty to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses. See that? And of course, he, uh, here it says what is written in the Torah of Moshe. That's how it's translated here by Mr. David Stern. See my brothers and sisters? And here it says, Kakatal, Kakatal, Betra Moshe. That's what that's how it reads in the Hebrew scriptures there. So notice that. So all we got to do, family, is we can go and examine the written law of Moses of Masha and see that Masha teach that people can have multiple wives. But we know Masha taught what in Deuteronomy that a king was not to multiply what? Not only horses to himself. He was not to multiply what? Wives to himself. And silver and gold to himself. Isn't that what Masha wrote? But see, these people, they want, they want to try to do what? You, they want to try to usurp his authority. But I have a father, Abba Yahuwah, he sees what you're doing, and he's going to put a stop to it, because you're not going to do it. Thank you, Father, my king. And those of you who continue to do it, Father's going to deal with you in the judgment. So notice what he said here. Let's continue and learn. Look at verse four. It's so as he's continuing talking to his son, he says, so that Yahuwah may establish his promise, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons keep their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not have a man cut off from the throne of Israel. Notice that. Notice the promise of the descendants sitting on that throne. You see this? Mind you now, the promise of the Mashiach is going to come from the son of David. Mind, mind that. So notice how he's giving his son counsel as far as telling him to be obedient to everything written in the law of Moses. And notice how he brings forth what? The promise. Notice that. See, David was holding on to that promise that Abba made with him. And notice how the, not only is the, the, the law of Moses being passed down as far as for his son to keep it, but notice how David, Dawiyah, is giving what? He's revealing the promise as well 
with the law of Moses. He's given the promise. He's given the promise that was given to him by Abba Yahuwah to give his son that promise as well. Notice that. That's very significant. You see, my brothers and sisters. Now, thank you, Father King, for your wisdom. Now, let's go stay in 1 Kings now, but I want you to uh, flip over to chapter 3, and you can also look at it with me. So 1 Kings chapter 3 now, we're going to go and examine the life of Solomon. Because again now, thank you, Father King. See, there's a lot of people out there. Now, see, you, see, Abba have it where you, you couldn't, you can't escape with David now. But see, now you're going to go and, and, and basically go to Shalomah, many know him as Shil uh, Shilomo or Solomon. And now people, they, they read when Solomon had all these women and concubines. And so now you got these, these men out here with their sexual appetites. Now they, not, not also what he's talking about David, now they're talking about Solomon. They're talking about, man, we can have, we can have multiple wives like Solomon too. Right? We see, what the we see what Solomon's father, what David said to him as far as the counsel that he told him and instructed him what to do pertaining to everything written in the law of Moses. So if you can go in the law of Moses, which you can't go in there and find anywhere where Moses commanded multiple wives that a king could have or that any just as far as a citizen of Israel Pertaining to the commonwealth, there's no law or commandment in there of a man that he can have multiple wives. There's no stipulations and intricate details that if one of the multiple wives get out of line or if a group of them get out of the line, then the man who got these multiple wives, he can divorce three, four, five of them and keep two of them, three of them, and then get some more women and they can all join the band. There's no in the law of Moses where you won't find that. You see this? So now we're going to examine our, our, and our father King lead to go to his servant Solomon to show what happened and then show as far as, you know, the mistakes that were made by Solomon due to multiple wives that you men out here hold up the scriptures talk about you men and teachers of Elohim when you need to repent. Thank you, Father Marquis. Let's go. Thank you, Master. So now let's go to 1 Kings chapter 3. Let's look at verse 10. And look at, let's read this carefully. It says, and it was pleasing in the sight of the master, Adonai, that Solomon, or Shalom, had asked this thing. See, this, my family, this is, the context is right when, as far as our, now our Heavenly Father appeared to Shalom, Shalom twice. And this is where our father, the first time he asked him to, you know, ask what he will. And then, of course, Solomon asked for wisdom. See this, my family? Now watch, and notice how it was pleasing to Adonai that Shalomah did this. Now let's look at verse 11. And the Almighty said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to listen to justice, Behold, or look, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. You see what our father said? Let's continue as our father king continues. Verse 13, as our father continues speaking, he says, I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. Look at verse 14. Now, if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments as your father David or Dawiyad walked, then I will prolong your days. See this? Look at verse 15. Then... Solomon or Shalom awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem or Yerushalayim and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of Adonai and offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. So notice how, as far as what Abba told him and how he said, if he would be obedient. You see this? And for people to sit there and say, well, we want to be like Solomon. 
Well, notice where our father said how there will be no king like you. You see this? So it's interesting how, again, people will go into the life of Solomon and they will try to pick and choose certain parts of his life, as well as the kings, David as well, as well as as far as, uh, you know, the, the prophets, the patriarchs. And they will try to pick things to try to say, OK, yeah, we can live like this. We don't, we don't want to live like that, though. You know, see, a lot of you, you don't want to you don't want to really wear like the garments you know, the turbans and things like that. Many of you, you want to hear, you want to wear hats and basketball jerseys. See this? See this? You want to drive the nice cars. See, a lot of you, you're not going to go all the way out, all the way to Israel. You're not going to go get the horses and ride on horses. No, you want the Mercedes Benz. You want these other cars, right? You want the foreigns and the nice cars. And you're going to have all these multiple wives with you. And a lot of these multiple, thank you, Pastor. A lot of you uh, multiple wives, some of you are ignorant. In trapping these things, you need to get out. Check your man with the word. But a lot of you, a lot of you, you don't really want to really, really live like the daughters of Sarah. You don't really want to ride on camels. You want to sit in a nice pasture side with air conditioned. Yes, you want to have your nice high heel shoes on. You want to have the nice women garments that they wear today. You don't really want to be like how the daughters of Sarah was very humble, right? Camels and horses. You don't want to ride with your husband like that. Many of you false prophets out there, you don't want to ride to your events, these events where you're going to preach the word, and you're riding on camels, and all your multiple wives are riding on camels too, or horses, galloping around. You don't really, really come to an event like that, do you? You want to come with nice cars, right? Nice garments, AC in the, in the car, all that. You don't really want to have this view all the way out, do you? So what I'm saying, my family, is you need to repent across the board. And understand the beautiful covenants. We don't negate the covenants, but understand the intricate details of ancient Israel and the covenant that we're in now. This is what we got to really understand. You see, it's my brothers and sisters. See, a lot of people, they, they talk about their Israel, but again, they're wearing basketball jerseys. You see this? They're wearing hats all cocked to the side. You see this? They want to have, you know, they got the nice smartphones swiping all around. They don't really want to go Israel out. A lot of them, they got the gun on them. They don't really want to have the arrows and, and the daggers like how our ancestors really had. They really don't want to go all the way Israel like how they claim they want to. You understand? Thank you, Father, my king. So now, my brothers, let's go back and let's focus and learn and see what happened to our ancestor Shalomah. He was a good king, but then he made some errors. Now let's look at 1 Kings and let's go to the 11th chapter. And let's look at verse 1. And it says here, it reads, Now King Solomon, or Shalomah, loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, or Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. You see that? You see the problem? That our ancestor fell into. This is not to speak evil of him. This is just showing you what the scriptures proclaim. This was one of the reasons why our ancestor fell. You understand? This is not, not saying that women in general are evil, but notice how our ancestor, very wise king, do you see this? But notice the fall and what happened and why the kingdom was divided. Look at verse 2. It says, from the nations concerning which Yahuwah had said to the sons of Yahshua, you shall not go along with them, nor shall they go along with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods or their mighty ones. Solomon or Shalomah clung to these in love. You see this? This is something that he was deeply in love with. He clung to it. He was attached to it, as it reads in the CJB. You understand? Now, let's look at how many wives, and let's look at the women that he had. Look at verse 3. And he had 700 wives. Now, let's highlight this. See, a lot of you out there playing around. Now, a lot of you out there don't have this many. Probably couldn't even handle this many. But let's look at it. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned him away. Matter of fact, let's just highlight the whole verse. You know, this is so that way it can really sink in. Look how many women he had. Not just, not just the women, well, it's not just wives. Now, how many of, now you all do the math. This is this is not hard. It's not a rocket scientist. It's not, it's not hard to do. It's not rocket scientist. 
do the math, get a calculator. Those of you, as I find a king, let us just have have fun, fun, not play with his word, but just have fun and just, as I find a king, expose these doctrines of devils. Get a calculator, my family, or you just get, get a, some of you should know what seven plus three is, and just add this together. And then ask yourself, if you say you're a man of the most high, ask yourself, would you, you want this? A lot of you are struggling with, with one. So, you know what I'm saying? So we see how many women, could you imagine the, the personalities and the, and, the, and the grievances and the complaints and the issues, the social issues that this man had to deal with? He had to please these women. Look at verse four. Thank you, Master. Now it happened at the time that Shalomah was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, or Elohim, and his heart was not wholly devoted to Yahweh, his almighty, as the heart of David, a doubt Yah, his father, had been. You see that, my brothers and sisters? Look at what happened to our ancestor. You see this? Look at verse, verse 5. For Shalomah went after Ashtarah, or Ashtarah, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milikon, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Look at this. What our ancestor did, what happened to him. Look at verse 6. And Solomon, or Shalomah, did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. And did not follow Yahuwah fully as David and Yah his father had done. Then Shalomah built a high place for Hamash, the detestable idol of Moab, and the mountain which is east of Yerushalayim, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Verse 8. This also he did for all his born wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. You see this? Look at this, my brothers and sisters. This is powerful. Look at this. See, this is what our ancestor had to deal with. Notice how he has to do what? He's appeasing what was going on. Not all of these women, he had a lot of them, but not all of them was worshiping Abba Yahuwah. You see, it's my brothers and sisters. Look at verse 9. It says, now Yahuwah was angry with Shalomah because his heart was turned away from Yahuwah, the Almighty of Yahshua, who had appeared to him twice. Notice that. Verse 10, it says, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not walk after other gods, or Elohim. But he did not keep what Yahuwah had commanded. Verse 11, so Yahuwah said to Shalomah, because this has happened with you, you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, so I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Do you see, my brothers and sisters? Notice the sad state that our ancestor fell into, and he had the multiple women around him. You understand my family? So for all you, you hypocrite and pastors out there, so-called pastors and leaders and elders, of, if you say you represent Israel, you represent the scriptures, are you going to sit here and tell, tell your men you can have 50 wives, set, you can have the same amount of wives that Solomon had? You can have concubines too, just like Solomon? Huh? Come out of your darkness in the name of Bible Yahweh, the great creator. And for those of you who love Master Yahushua, of course, many of you call him Yahshua, Yeshua, you have different forms. The question is that Master Yahushua would teach a doctrine like that. You're going to sit here and hold up the scriptures. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, my king, your precious Holy Spirit. You're going to sit here and got the nerve to hold up the scriptures. Not only are you saying you claiming the Torah or the Tanakh, many of you holding up saying you, you proclaim the bread hot and shock, you talking about you living like the apostles. And you saying that you love the Messiah. The question is, did the Messiah teach and tell his disciples, my 12 disciples, I want you to, thank you, Master. Did you think our king said, I want you to go and have, teach all the nations of the, all the disciples to have multiple wives? Did Master Yahushua would say that? Did Master Yahushua would himself have multiple wives? Now, there was women walking around him with his multiple wives. You hypocrites. Thank you, my father, my king. You need to repent and ask you who she was named. 
Now, as a father can be, let's go and let's look at the wisdom of Solomon to see one of the things about our ancestor Solomon, great king, he fell into errors. We've all made errors. And we see what our king, as far as our king Solomon, what happened to him. Our king David, our ancestor, he told his son, as far as our king, Solomon. Now, he's not the most high king, but as far as Israel is concerned, Solomon, he told him to be obedient to the commandments and everything written in the law of Moses. We see where he deviated from. We see what happened to him. But our ancestor wrote some very interesting words to admonish us, the generations to come. Now, let's look at what Solomon said. And let's see if Solomon, when he wrote Proverbs, we're going to see the little certain Proverbs and wisdom literature that he wrote. We're going to see if Solomon wrote when, when he had he had been in ancient times, because he, he was a, a poet and, and wrote a lot of songs and prophets too. Just his father was a, a, a prophet as well. David wrote many songs and wisdom literature. We're going to see when Solomon wrote, we're going to see if Solomon said, uh, my future generation, you can have multiple wives like how I did. We're going to see if Solomon wrote that or taught that, or is that just coming from you? And your father, the devil, who's using you, saying that Abba said it was okay, that it was a commandment given from the great Abba himself. We're going to find that out. Let's go into the scriptures, my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Master. Let's go to Proverbs 5. And let's see what our ancestor wrote for future generations. He says, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my discernment that you may keep discretion and that your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drip honey and smoother than oil is her speech. Notice what he's doing now. He's not demonizing women because you got some angry women out there who's going into our ancestors right and saying, the Bible hate women and Solomon hate women. He hate us women. He's talking about the strange woman. You hypocrite and women out there who's trying to seduce men with your bodies and you're, you're, you're trying to lower and, and trying to bring a man down. He's talking about women used by the enemy like you all out there. He's not talking to the holy women, to the set apart, the kadash women. He's not talking about you all. He's talking about a certain type of woman. You see this? Notice how he mentions about the strange woman. You see this, my brothers and sisters? All right, now look at verse four. He says, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Verse 5, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. That's powerful, isn't it? See, the wrong type of woman can lead you to death. You see this? And the same thing goes for a man, but as far as the context, Solomon is dealing with what? Women. He knew all of them, didn't he? Can we see what was his downfall? Now, look at verse 6. He says, Lest she watch the path of life, her tracks are unstable. She does not know it. Now, look at verse 7. He says, So now, my sons, listen to me, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your splendor to others and your years to the cruel one. That's powerful, isn't it? You see it in my family? Look what he says, verse 10, as he continues. Lest strangers be satisfied by your strength and by your painful labor, those in the house of a foreigner. You see what he's talking about? Dealing with the context of, of the strange woman. He's not talking about all women. Look at verse 11. And you groan at your end when your flesh and your body are consumed. And you say, how I have hate discipline, hated discipline and my heart spurred reproof. I have not listened to the voice of my instructors and I have not inclined my ear to my teachers. See this? That's the problem with a lot of us today. We're not looking back up as far as our ancestors, the beautiful things that was taught. Wisdom. We're not listening to that. And this is why many of us have the problems that we're going through. Look at verse 14. 
He, he continues. He says, I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. Now watch what he says here. Now this is powerful. Now we're going to see if he talked saying that obviously you can have more than one wife. Look what he says here. He says, drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Now, for those of you out there who have the spirit of the almighty in you, as the beautiful poetry, I find the king allowed the illusions and parables of what the great poet is saying to us. Notice how he's contrasting. He already talked about the strange women and as far as the uh, those things that can happen to someone who doesn't listen, as far as the pain that they will they will go through, you understand? Now he's telling the generations after him to do what? He's talking about a relationship here. Look what he says. He says, drink water from your own sister and fresh water from your own well. Look at verse 16. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Look what he's saying. Look what he's saying. He says, should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Look what he says here. He says, let them be for you alone and not for strangers with you. Look at verse 18. Let them be for you alone. Okay, we read it again. Let read it again. Let them be for you alone and not, not for strangers with you. Verse 18. Let your fountain be blessed and be glad in the wife of your youth. You see that? Notice how this is something, isn't it? Let's look at this. Notice how wife is in the singular. You see that? Let's look at that. Notice what he's saying. The wife of your youth. See, my brothers and sisters? Me, et, look at the Hebrew. Me esh, me esh na ureka. See that? Solomon is not teaching the future generations after him, saying, be like me when I made errors, when I had multiple women, and, and, I, and I built false gods. I want y'all to do that too. That's not what Solomon is saying. He's leaving behind wisdom. He's leaving behind wisdom that he learned, lessons that he learned, tell, telling both of us in the future generations not to go down that path because he experienced them. Look at verse 19. He says, as a loving hind and a graceful, graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be intoxicated always with her love. Now, wait a minute. Hold on now. Thank you, Father Key. My family, is Solomon, the king, when he's writing beautiful, beautiful wisdom, words of wisdom, is he telling the future generations after him, Notice how when he says breast, you know, breast, and he's describing the woman. Notice how it's as far as in the singular. Is he telling people saying, you know, enjoy and indulge and all the rhythms and all the rhythms? Is that what Solomon is that what Solomon is saying, my family? Is he telling us, those after him, my children, those of you take note to the wives, take all the older women? Is that what he's saying? No, he's not. And if any demon devil influence and so-called pastor get out here and hold the scriptures and say that they are liars and you need to get out of their assemblies. If they're not willing to repent and change, you need to leave. If they're willing to open up their eyes and say, you know, I was wrong. This, you know, I, I thought that we could have multiple eyes. It was commanded from Abba Yahuwah. I didn't rightly divide the intricate details of what was going on with our ancestors, my family, especially if you say you believe in the New Testament. You know, but even those of you who are deniers of the New Testament, those of you who are Toms, traitors of Messiah, even if you want to deny, you still can't move around too much and wiggle around in the Tanakh because our father's going to shut you down there. So you're not going to be able to get around that. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Father King, who you are. So now let's continue to learn the wisdom literature. So let's read it again. Verse 19, he says, as a loving hide and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be intoxicated always with her love. You see this, my family? That's powerful, isn't it? Look what it says in the, in the Hebrew. It says, ah, it says, ah, yeleh, ahabim, where yah elah, 
pain that they have. Yar, it says Yarauda. Yarau, Yarauka, sorry, thank you, Robert King. They call it Ba'ahal Vataha Tishge Tami. You see this? He's not talking about having all these multiple whips satisfied with all the multiple, uh, it, you know, breasts, breasts here, this beautiful, look at this. This is not um, as far as, he did not say that uh, as far as in, in the plural sense. You see, it's my family. So, you know, we just got to really look at what the scripture is saying. Look at verse 20. He says, so why should you, my son, be intoxicated with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a foreign woman. Do you see what he's talking about? See, he can speak on that because he made those errors. So our king, as far as Solomon is concerned, Master Yahushua Messiah is, is my king. But what I'm saying is in ancient Israel, as far as our ancestors, we did have kings of Israel now, King David, King Solomon. Why would Solomon speak on something like that? Because he was able to experience it. He understood the difference between as far as a strange woman and a woman that was supposed to be for him. He understood that. Verse 21, he says, for the ways of a man are before the eyes of Yahoo, and he watches all his tracks. See, understand, Yahoo is watching all of us. This is what he wants the future generations to know. Verse 22, his own iniquities will capture him, who is the wicked one. And with the cords of his sin, he will be held fast. You see that, my family? See, everybody's going to reap what they sow. When you do crime, when you do evil, it's going to catch up to you. See, this is what King Solomon was saying. Look at verse 23. He will die for lack of discipline. And in the abundance of his folly, he will stumble in intoxication. That's powerful, my brothers and sisters. So even, you know, as a father can lead, we're able to learn from our ancestor <clears throat> as far as living in, in the right way. You see, my brothers and sisters, being obedient as far as learning from the lessons. He's, a, he's talking about the things that he experienced. He's warning future generations as far as not to do. You see, my brothers and sisters, you understand my family? Now, Thank you so much, Father McKean, for who you are. So the, th the thing is this. We've examined as our Father King, let's look at you and be able to explore as far as, you know, King David, King Solomon. It's just interesting how uh, we also looked at, uh, thank you, Master, for reminding me. We also looked at uh, as far as, you know, Hannah, Elkanah, you know, as, as, as well. And so even people who will go to, um, like, for example, in the book of Judges, they'll go to Gideon and they'll say, well, look, Gideon had multiple wives and he was a righteous man. But again, when you when you read Judges, the statements as far as how men did what was right in their at that time, there was no king. Men did what was right in their own eyes. And this is something that we have to be willing to learn, my family, is that you have it where people uh, it's not saying all men of Israel were just. Uh, straight up just, you know, evil people. Now, as, as a whole, you, you did, did have the nation that did evil, that did wickedness. But you had men that really loved our Heavenly Father. But you also have to be able to understand the certain customs and the social constructs, the social backgrounds. You see, it's my family. Israel was not the only people as far as uh, in the ancient Near East, in the Levant, that actually... Uh, had, you know, some of them, not all, but Israel was not the only one who practiced having um, multiple wives, certain ones of them. You see this? So you have some people that hold up the word and they'll make you think that every man of Israel had multiple wives. And that's not true. You see this? Because we can go into the Tanakh and we can see where it talks about more than one man, but you had instances where some of them had more than one wife, and some of them didn't. So if you have somebody that says, oh, the patriarchs, all of them had multiple wives, they're lying. You see this? You see, it's my family. 
in the scriptures, it doesn't say that Isaac had um, more than one wife. You see, it's my family. So that's a lie. You understand? So again, my family, as a father can lead, um, as his, father, uh, his beautiful teaching will continue. So again, in the, in the Tanakh, it's pretty much locked down. For those people out there who are these so-called men that are holding up the word, talking about they can have multiple wives, Father King has already dealt with them in regards to that. But for those of you out there who are now holding up the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, and you're saying that you're a disciple of Master Yahushua of the Nazarene now. See this? See, for those of you now, see, you're not going to be able to run. And as a Father King lead for the precious spirit, we'll deal with you accordingly. You see, it's my family. So my family, I, I continue to uh, encourage you to stay strong in the faith. Um, I, I'm so thankful uh, how Father King is just surgically dealing with the Tanakh as he would deal with the, uh, the Brit Hadashah uh, as, as our Father King for the presence of the part spirit has been very surgical and will deal with this matter. And again, it's not to embarrass uh, or not to be in a hatred, you know, a hateful way or in hatred to those people out there who are teaching this doctrine of uh, polygamy and polygyny. Uh, and, and you have some that even agree with uh, polyandry as far as uh, women having multiple men and things of that nature. And so again, um, you need to, we need to repent. You see this? And if you're saying that you, you really believe in the scriptures, then what you're going to do is you're going to learn and you're going to grow. And if there's error, then you'll be able to go back and reread it and, and, and repent. But when people will sit here and uh, try to usurp our Heavenly Father's word, as well as his son's word, what he was led to say, um, to usurp the words of the prophets and the apostles, and that's not right to do, my brothers and sisters. And so my family, in the name of Abba Yahuwah, through their precious, uh, my father, through his precious son, Master Yahushua, with their precious teaching, their precious set apart spirit, I bid all of you well, continue to stay strong in the faith, Stand strong against the toms, the traitors of Messiah. Stay strong against the rats, the rebels of the truth. You see, it's my family. And stay strong against the little Nickies out there. You see this? There's a lot of, a lot of little Nickies out there, you know. <laughs> and we got to stay strong against the little Nickies, the, the little sons of Satan out there, you know. But at the same time, we can't forget that when we were little Nickies and and we were, we were toms and we were rats, you know, traitors of the Messiah and, and rebels against the truth. We have to repent, my brothers and sisters, and stay strong in faith. And so anyway, as a father king lead, I love all of you, all the men of Master Yahuwah, all the women of Master Yahuwah, I salute you. Not the fake ones out there. Now, I hope you repent, you know, but there's many fake ones out there who, who saying that they want a fellowship. And then when the fellowship comes and now they, they, want, to, they want to do a little switcheroo Houdini trick. Not dealing with those, but for now you need to repent. But for the real ones, I salute you. I hope that all of you are doing well. For the men of the Most High, those of you who are not only holding up the Tanakh and teaching it as our Father King guides you, but also the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, those of you who are proclaiming Master Yahushua as the true Messiah, as the Son of the Living Almighty, the Son of David, the Son of Dawiyah, I salute you. Those who are uh, filled with the precious set of our spirit of our Father and our King. You see this? I said, all of you continue to stand strong in the faith. You know what you need to do. You see my brother, my brothers, my true brothers. You understand? So in the name of Master Yahushua of Nazareth, with the presence of our spirit, in the name of Abba Yahuwah, Maratha, amen, and keep looking up to Master Yahushua, the Messiah, and I have a father, Abba Yahuwah, who sent him with the presence of our spirit. Maratha, amen. Thank you, my father, my king.